Hola amigos, welcome to the Digital Nomad series with myself and the CEO of Luz Collective, Lucy Flores. In this series, we will do a deep dive of what it means to be a digital nomad. So make sure you like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. Hola. Can you hear me? Yes. What was that? I'm coming to you live from Playa del Carmen from my Airbnb kitchen. Hi, everyone joining. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, quick recap. I am living in Mexico, been here since the beginning of December. LA was facing another lockdown. Um, my father had just died. It was just tough times all around. And I just could not face another. I know, Karina. Okay, Karina can see the shirts. Uh, that's good. I wasn't sure if um, the format allowed for it. Yay, Karina is a uh, very, very awesome Loose Collective supporter, is a writer's room supporter, so thank you. Um, totally off topic, we're just going to like randomly talk about everything except for being a digital nomad. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, I couldn't face another, it was just such a tough time, I couldn't imagine being stuck inside, you know, under, under those conditions. Um, and so I decided, well, if I'm going to be stuck somewhere, then I might as well be stuck on a beach. And, and I also wanted to feel more connected to my dad's roots being Mexican um, and having traveled to Mexico off and on my entire life. I just felt like drawn, you know, to wanting to be here. Um, and, and that was it. You know, I made the decision. I decided to we are a digital media company because of the uh, pandemic. We were forced to go entirely, shift entirely, work from home. So the entire Loose Collective team is now all over the country and fully remote. And so it was just an opportunity that I thought to myself, you know, when are we ever going to be in these conditions again, um, for good or bad, you know? Um, but why not take advantage? And now that we can, we might as well do it, you know, and, and here we are. I know, I know. And I've told you this so many times that I'm vicariously living through you because you are in Playa del Carmen. So why Playa del Carmen? I mean, I know you said uh, beach, but why specifically that uh, location? My, so I initially started in Tulum and was in Tulum for just over a month and again, drawn to Tulum because I had been there before and it was just to me, you know, at least what I remembered about it was like a place for serenity and, and you could be outdoors safely, you know, you didn't have to be in crowds. Um, I'm an outdoors person. I love running. I love working out outdoors. I love hiking. I love anything that's outdoors. So Tulum just made a lot of sense. But then once I got here, it didn't make that much sense. <laughs> Um, because then, you know, that's, I think what we're going to talk about today is the, uh, the actual practice, you know, not the theory and yep. yeah, in theory, it was an awesome idea in practice, not so much. Uh, and I just had all kinds of issues from Wi-Fi to dependable power to, um, being stuck in an Airbnb that actually had like the noisiest neighbors in the world that, I, you know, was like having to suppress violent tendencies to like punch people in the face. I was like, I'm into loom. I'm in a channel to loom and like, you know, not, <laughs> not do anything terrible to my neighbors. Uh, the, the location yeah. was like super dark. So it was like really depressing. So it was like the opposite of, uh, of what I thought it was going to be. So yeah, lots of learnings for sure in being, in Tulum. And that's how I migrated up to Playa. Yeah. And I think you make a perfect point that, um, you know, we have the, we envision certain places to be a certain way, but when you get there, life hits you and life is life, right? Um, so let's talk about those transitions and what does it actually look like to be living in Playa um, or what it was like in Tulum and that, you know, difficulty and, and what your day to day has been looking like, how difficult that transition has been, or maybe, maybe it hasn't been that difficult, right? What has that experience been like? It's been difficult on some ends and not difficult on others. You know, um, I think the, the bad part and the reason why we're doing this series is because people have all kinds of just practical questions, you know, um, 
Like, what's the immigration situation like? How do you make friends? I know we have like some questions about, you know, how do you build community and things like that. Um, but it's not all nice and roses and flowers, right? Instagram is totally about this manufactured life that you want people to see. And the fact of the matter is that that's not the reality for anyone. Um, this has definitely been very difficult. Um, I, you know, it's not like I was, you can't run away from grief. Um, ah, uh, even in a beautiful place or a beautiful setting, I think that our mental capacity for what's in front of us can sometimes not win us over, right? Even right. I mean, you can't you can't run away from problems. If you're becoming a digital nomad because you think you're going to ra- run away from stuff, that's that's just not it, right? Like, there's no such thing. And um, I, you know, I I've, I've had my ups and downs. Uh, you know, just this, these last like five days have been really hard, uh, for some reason, you know, just really missing my dad still and still dealing with that grief. Um, obviously managing a company day to day, those things don't go away. Um, so anyone who is thinking about being a digital nomad or, you know, thinks that if you, that if you take a vacation or go away, you know, that all of a sudden everything's going to be better. It's not right. Like you are definitely in a different environment. Um, but your mindset has to be different too. You know, your, um, the, you know, the way in which you perceive life is always going to have to, um, follow with you. And, um, and, you know, that's definitely been a process for me here, uh, in Playa has been really just like, you know, d- taking life as it comes and, um, and moving forward every day, every day. Yeah. And, and of course, like managing the day-to-day, um, things like Wi-Fi, you know, like Wi-Fi in and of itself is like, you just have no idea. You, you start to literally dictate your life based on where you can find Wi-Fi. Yeah. So and, and and we're shifting a little bit, but I think it's important, like what you're touching on, and we're ha- we're getting a couple of comments on how people people's lives are perceived a certain way through social media, and because we're working in the space, because you're building to uh, you're working to build a digital media company around Latinas and our stories. What what's that experience like to be in Playa, to be surrounded by beautiful things, and then? somehow disconnect from social media even though you're leading this company um to live in the in the present and deal with your personal life it's uh, um again you know it's it's not yeah the i i obviously tr- i'm all, i'm a half glass full person that you know that's that's always been my approach but in terms of um where you are you're always going to have to try to find the beauty no matter where you are certainly being able to travel and being able to live in different countries and especially now during covid um you're going to have to you have other opportunities but you still have to focus on um the things that you have available to you and that you could take advantage of and certainly here you know during those tough times that I was just talking about, you know, I would just, I woke up, I would wake up at dawn a couple times and I would walk to the beach and I would just sit there and I would just take in the beauty of it all and remind myself that, that, you know, yeah, I might still have problems and I might still have issues and I might still have so many life stresses, but I also was, was intentionally reminding myself that, that we have so much beauty around us. And, and that is definitely a privilege that I recognize that I have, that I'm able to come here and that, you know, maybe others um, listening also have an opportunity to do. Again, it's different during COVID. You have to be much more thoughtful, responsible, careful, et cetera. It's not like you get this free pass and people who do travel, whether it's for nomad purposes or whether it's for, uh, I mean, nobody should be vacationing right now. Right. Um, but if you're traveling, um, you know, you still ha- you carry with you that, that responsibility as well, um, to ensure that, you know, you're not carrying your disease everywhere. So yeah. lots of things to consider. Yeah. And so those are like deeper conversations we can have, you know, maybe on the next one, let's talk about like your, your daily 
things that you're, you know, that you need, that you use the, in the U.S., I think we take for granted the fact that maybe I run out of my favorite shampoo and I can go down to CVS, shop for it, and then, you know, it's it's a done deal. Or I can order on Amazon if it's a special brand and I get it within, you know, the next day or, or whatever. What is that experience like in, in Mexico? Hi, Uriel. Thank you. Uh, just seeing some of these responses. Um, but uh, so the hilarious thing is that in the digital nomad community, because of immigration purposes, you do have to go back. You have to do what's called a visa run. So you do have to go back at least in Mexico every six months before your expiration. And now that the United States and Canada, which this is a good thing, have put in place COVID testing, you have to have a negative COVID test before you go back. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's creating like all of these, you have to plan ahead, essentially. Mm -hmm. So as people are planning ahead and coming back, um, they kind of offer themselves up as mules. And so you have, so people place orders with these people that are coming back from either going to or coming from the United States. And they're loading up with things like deodorant or your shampoo or whatever, because there are a lot of things that you cannot get in Mexico. So, or, or whatever country you're in, mm -hmm. or depending on what part of the country you're in, you know, you could be in a, um, you know, remote jungle area and, and not have what you need. I recently had someone bring me back a cord, uh, a um, charging cord for my um, electric toothbrush. Like when my electric, when I realized I left the cord and I started brushing my teeth one day and realized that my electric toothbrush wasn't working, I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? <laughs> and then I, like, it didn't occur to me that I could just move my electric toothbrush up and down. You know, I was like, That's you, so... you, you get so used to your yeah. luxuries, you know, I was just like, oh my God, how am I going to brush my teeth? And I was like, oh yeah, there's, you know, a toothbrush. You just like move it. Um, <laughs> Um, so I like I searched high and low for this uh, this cord, you know, Walmart, you name it, like every place that I could go to and nothing. So I finally got that. And when I got my electric toothbrush going, I it was like the most that was like the most exciting thing that happened to me this week. Um, oh, my friend hurts. who's I saw my friend who's a dentist uh, join earlier. If he's still on, I think he might appreciate that conversation. Okay. <laughs> that, no, but that's hilarious. And that's the reality of uh, what you're living, right? A lot of commodities there are a lot of luxuries that in the U.S. maybe don't seem like luxuries, but they are. And you have to be creative about how you get it, you know, or, or and or the alternatives that you find. It's not always bad, you know. Yeah. Um, I ran out of conditioner a long time ago. Of course, they sell conditioner here, but I ended up finding this really there's so many homeopathic and natural and small businesses here um, that you don't find in so many places in the U.S. Like everything is mass produced. Everything is like this is corporate, you know, it's global. And, and it was incredible also to be able to support a local economy in that way, you know, where um, there's so many things being made uh, locally with like, you know, natural and, and indigenous, like sometimes very long held um, you know, um, like medicinal practices, you know, you can buy those things here that you wouldn't, that you cannot find. And you, so it's the opposite too, you know, there's a lot of amazing things that you can get here locally that now when I do go back to the U.S. or, you know, once the pandemic is over, if I decide to move on to another country, um, that I'm not going to be able to find. So it's, yeah. it, you know, it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, because of that, what you're saying is a personal question that I'm very curious about, and that's the food. There's things in Mexico that you just absolutely won't find in, you know, over here. So what is, what does your diet look like over there? What is it, you know, your a typical restaurant or food or dish? Um, I'm so curious just because I don't want to say I'm a foodie, but I definitely <laughs> just, I eat my way through trips, right? Like that's how I plan where I'm going to go. Yeah. I've definitely had to up my exercise game for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Like trying not to, to gain a ton of weight here. Um, I, so street food is obviously huge all over Mexico. It's no different here in, in this, in a smaller town. Um, if not, if anything, there's more of it and, and it's incredibly cheap. So, 
I am spending so, so much less money on, I, I don't cook. So that's the other thing that's, you know, like, I don't know if it's easier or harder because um, I don't have to buy groceries, but like, mm-hmm. I legit just, there are very few things I can make in like toast is the extent <laughs> of what I can make. So, um, so that means, you know, I'm constantly in search of food and, and it's just so incredibly cheap. And it's also so much healthier, even like quote unquote street bad food is going to be better for you because all of the ingredients are not processed. They're whole ingredients, right? Like they're making their masa. They are, um, all of the tortillas are pretty much handmade. You know, the, the, um, the vegetables are what we would consider farm to table, right? In the U S like everything's farm to table Mm -hmm. here. Um, because it's not coming through these massive production chains. There is some of it, of course, you know, but so much of what you're growing, what, what you're eating is not processed. It's um, made from scratch, whole ingredients, et cetera. So, um, you know, even in that, in that respect, you're still able to, I think, ingest um, ingredients that are just like so much better for you than, than yeah. you would back home. But yeah, yeah, street, street food is everywhere. So, you know, of course, like, like, when, you know, I, I don't know if anyone remembers taco trucks on every corner from, <laughs> from the campaign like a couple of years ago. Um, but there are definitely tacos on every corner here. So you, you gotta like watch yeah. your taco intake cause it can, yeah, it can catch up to you. That's, that's hilarious. And somebody's actually asking, they're curious, what are some of the foods you can get in the street besides tacos? Well, I mean, besides like every conceivable form of taco that you could possibly think of. Um, it, I think so, like lots of things like fresh fruit, um, esquites, they're this thing, mm-hmm. there's things called um, mariquesas or something. Uh, I don't think I'm saying it right. Uh, lots of different food that you, that's like regional, you know, that I've never seen before. There's cold pozole, which I was like, um, I don't know about cold pozole. <laughs> pozole is supposed to be warm. It's supposed yeah. to have like cilantro and stuff on it. Um, but yeah, like little streetcar vendors walk around with pozole, cold pozole. I'm like, I haven't tried it yet, but I'm Are sure it's not, you? I'm sure it's not what I've been thinking. I'm sure right. it's kind of something completely different, but I have not ventured to try it. Um, but I mean, yeah, you can just think about every kind of conceivable food possible. And there's somebody walking by with it, you know, like they walk around those panaderos. So, you know, folks who, a panaderia that you would go to, um, a, a bread store, um, they have like mobile panaderio, panaderos. They walk around with sometimes like these big uh, plastic, these silicone, you know, whatever they are, um, plexiglass kind of boxes on their head. Mm-hmm. And there's just like, you know, filled with fun. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It, oh, so God. yes, it's, you, you will never lack a snack. That's for sure. And the fresh fruit is yes, absolutely amazing. That's, that sounds like heaven, to be honest. Um, and so I, I do want to transition over into questions that we received from the audience, because I actually just saw uh, one of our followers who joined in who asked a question. So I want to go ahead and ask his question. Um, his at is Alfred AG. Um, and he asked a really important question that I think a lot of us are curious, and it's around community. And because we're also talking about food, which tends to be the way that you build community, um, how do you build community during a pandemic um, in a different country and a new country where you you maybe know someone? I don't know. But what does that look like? It's it's the same way. You know, you got to put yourself out there if you are and it could be virtually right again, because considering the pandemic, you know, you're 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 definitely not going to be doing anything above and beyond than what you would be doing in your own home in terms of being careful. Um, you're unfortunately, you know, not able to go to parties and do the regular stuff that you would do. So you end up developing a lot of relationships virtually. Um, I, I'm a part of like five different WhatsApp groups. Um, but I had to search for them. You know, I joined a bunch of Facebook expat groups and, and people start posting and you engage with them and, and then you find people that are, that are aligned with you. I just, I just left a WhatsApp group this morning 
because it's a, it's a meetup group and it was just being taken over by anti-maskers and that kind of toxicity. I was happy to leave for a while in the United, the United States. And I'm not trying to join that toxicity here. You know, like if you want to, um, if, if anti-masking is your thing, I don't want to subject myself to that. Right. Um, and it's also, it's not worth, obviously fighting with these people because they're going to continue being irresponsible and science deniers and everything else. And, and so, you know, you choose to leave and I chose to leave. So it's this, it's the same concept, you know, you find your tribe, you find your people. And, um, and, and it's in the same way we've been doing it all, all of this last year, really learning how to, develop um, relationships virtually and get to know people that way. Um, and then you can do a socially distanced meetup. You know, I, I definitely do brunches and dinner and things like that with folks all the time. So it's just a, it's a much, much small, it's a small group. It's, it's, um, you're doing it as safe as you possibly can. Um, you're following the restrictions, following the rules. I never do anything indoors. I'm always, always outside. Um, even though those things are allowed here, you know, you can, you can have dinner indoors unmasked. That to me is just crazy. Um, Blaya is currently experiencing another outbreak. Um, they just got moved up like many places in the world um, to, they have stoplights here, the colors. So it just moved from, um, from yellow to orange and, uh, and it's close to getting to red again. So they're starting to shut down stuff again, you know? Um, so lots of things are very similar, but a lot of things are, are obviously different because of the pandemic. But in terms of community, it's possible again, no matter where you are, you know, whether you're home or whether you're in a, in a different country, um, you just have to be intentional about it. You have to go out there and, and put yourself out there. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I can, I can agree to, I agree with that because you know that I just moved um, recently and finding friends as soon as the pandemic hit, it's like, it has to all be virtual. So I agree. Uh, we received a really good question on here. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump to this one as an entrepreneur, what resources or rituals do you find difficult to access while being a digital nomad? Any new ones? That's interesting. I think because so a lot of the things that I miss are like organizational tools mm -hmm. um, and also the ability to just like, for example, I saw some affirmation cards the other day that um, that, that a friend also, a uh, loose supporter, Tiffany Caban, uh, who I believe is running now for city council in New York, in New York city. She posted about these affirmation cards and I was like, oh my God, these are amazing. I want these. I would have bought them, but of course I can't ship anything here, at least not something like that. So I, you know, organizational things are a, a whiteboard, um, you know, things that I would want to make my, my work setting a little more, mm -hmm. um, pleasant, uh, or functional. It, it's a, it's a lot of functional stuff. You know, you gotta be super creative. Like that's the thing, but you know, here's the thing. If you're an entrepreneur, it means that you're already creative. It means that you are a solutions oriented person. It means that you're a problem solver. If you're an entrepreneur, you're figuring things out. So it's not any different here, you know, like, the fact that I had to pack so lightly and I couldn't bring like all of my office yeah. organizational luxuries with me, you know, um, you do what you got to do and, and you work with the little bit that you have. So I, I wouldn't say it makes it any more difficult. I just think that um, it's just different. That's all. And, and sometimes, you know, you want certain things here and there and you can't have them and that's okay. You figure out other ways, you know, like, okay, yeah. so I'm not going to have affirmation cards. I started looking on, um, on the internet and I was like screenshotting, um, affirmations, you know? And so I was like, oh, I yeah. could just do these. So it's, it's little things like that. Mm -hmm. Which, um, somebody else actually asked, uh, we wear video, um, that's his at or her, maybe. Um, and she or he asked, in regards to your work with Loose Collective, what has actually been the most challenging as part of the work? So I think it relates kind of to what you were speaking on, but specifically to Loose Collective, uh, leading a digital uh, or a remote team. Um, what, what are the challenges and how do you deal with that? 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, how Basically, much how do you? How deal much with time me? do we have? How much time do we have? That's the is question. This, is this an hour long conversation? <laughs> um, oh my god, I don't even know where to start or how to answer that question. It's such a broad question. Um, I, you know, I think that in 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 the context of this, of being a nomad and working from a different country right now, um, it really is like. I think it's a lot, a lot for me, it's like self-motivation, you know, um, it, especially again, like I said, you know, yeah, it's not like your day-to-day challenges have left. It's not like your, your traumas have left. It's not like your situ your personal situation is any different. Like you're still the same person. Um, and so I think for me, not being able to be fe- at least feel close to, my family. Um, I mean, obviously again, COVID, so it's not like we've been able to do that for a while anyway, but it's more of a mental thing, you know, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're somewhere alone and there's no one near you. Like, even if you wanted to, you know, you feel isolated sometimes. And, um, and I think as an entrepreneur, because it is so hard, you know, getting those clients, to come in the door, bringing that revenue in. So everyone's salaries can keep getting paid, um, getting your clients to pay, you know, uh, which is the worst part. You're trying to figure out like how many more months left payroll do I have left? And when are these people going to pay their bills? Um, that's like crazy stressful, you know, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes you're like, you know what, I can just go out and get a job. I can just go and get a job and and just get a paycheck and not have to worry about any of this. But then you have to remind yourself why you're doing it. That's the motivation part, you know, and being able to have this platform for Latinas um, to feel like they have a home, to see themselves reflected in our content, to, um, to feel like they belong to a community. They have a space. uh, They're seen. um, We, we hear you, we feel you, we are you. That is, that's, just so incredibly important to me and and to I think everyone who works for us and and that's why we keep at it you know like that's why we we don't give up and that's why we do what we do to just try to to provide and and to be the representation where we possibly can to the best of our ability and that's it um so that's what gets me through the days and you know, you wake up the next morning and you live to fight another day and publish another piece and hopefully, yeah. <laughs> you know, make, bring a smile to somebody else's face and, you know, have people feel proud and mission accomplished. Yeah. Okay. Live over. It's done. <laughs> you closed it up. No, uh, I'm, I'm kidding. But, you know, that's literally the perfect ending because I think that's, that's our goal, right? To show up and be vulnerable for not for this not for attention but for the sake of you know sharing that lived experience that so many people are going through and they just don't they feel alone like you said they feel alone especially during the pandemic and so I think this series um that's what it serves right to show other Latinas other Latinos that they can be digital nomads that they can be living this life because I think a lot of people think about digital nomads as like these like hippie bohemian white people who like you know just are like doing whatever in another country but that's not it right it's a way for us to reconnect with the places that we're from the cultures that we love and the things that we love so thanks for for being so vulnerable lucy i yeah i mean it's kind of what i do (laughs) without (laughs) without even like thinking about it trust me sometimes i'm like i i do wish for a different personality i feel like a different personality could be easier but you know uh there there was a there was a question that came in about mental health um which i think is a is a good segue for this conversation i know we're going to end soon so maybe we can end it here but um Yeah, we can go ahead and ask it. Um, This pandemic has really impacted mental health overall. As hospital crisis worker, I see it here. How are the mental health services for people um, in Mexico? Um, It's very limited. Um, But, you know, it's, it's so different here because I think that the, 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 like, family and friend structure, at least from what I've noticed, 
Um, it's, it's just so much more connected. Um, and, and so if you're, you know, obviously there's a difference between getting support from your friends and family and getting professional support and crisis intervention and, um, and therapy. Um, but when it comes to crisis, you, there's steps that led up to that crisis, right? So if you can, if you can mitigate, if you can take away the things that lead to that crisis, then you're obviously not going to need as much crisis services as you do in in other situations. So I think what I've noticed here is that there is just such a, 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 a good like family structure and a friend structure um, that folks have each other to depend on, you know, and to lean on. Um, I, I feel like that it that feels different in the United States. And this is obviously just from my perspective. I'm not citing statistics. I'm not, you know, this isn't a commentary on uh, the systems versus yeah. one or the other. Um, we could definitely talk about health in a, in a different conversation maybe next week. But um, yeah, I, I just think that that while there may be lacking in some departments, like actually having a crisis hotline, for example, that you can call, um, they, they make up for it in other ways. And, and I think that right now, at least no system is perfect, but the more that you have access to one another, um, you know, the more helpful that is to you and the more helpful that is to your mental health. So hopefully that answered the question. You know, I, I can't speak too, too deep onto, you know, like the actual services that are here. I have not researched, I haven't, but, but that's just, you know, my observation of, um, of how I see the, the differences in community when it comes to things like mental health. Yeah, and, and they responded and said, uh, what you're saying is exactly what I see. So I think you you hit it right on the head. Um, so with that being said, any final closing thoughts um, on just, you know, the lifestyle change that you've had and what you would, you know, let others know as they're considering becoming digital nomads themselves? Um, I mean, really, just in closing, I would say, you know, never think that something is out of the reach, out of reach for you. Um, if it feels right for you, if it feels like it's something that could be an option, try it, do it. I, I think like we stop ourselves so often from considering things that um, we think aren't for us. Starting a business, becoming a nomad, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is, uh, pursuing your education, running for office, you know, the list goes on. We, we maybe consider like, oh, that would be cool, but that's it. You stop there. You, you don't move forward with like, but could that actually be for me? You know, if you think to yourself, hey, this could actually be for me, then act on it, you know, do some research, um, Find one of the first things I did was I started looking at other YouTube videos of people, white people, by the way, no one who looked like me. <laughs> so it was like such a different experience because I would hear white people, so many, you know, on, on these, having these kinds of conversations and doing these YouTube videos. And I would think to myself, like, oh, girl, your experience is way different than mine because, you know, like I, they would talk about so many different issues that they had because they didn't know the culture and they didn't know the language and they didn't know these things. And I'm like, oh no, no, like your girl, you're doing it wrong. And I don't even live there, <laughs> you know? So like, you know, just if, if you think that something could be for you, then it is for you. Yeah. And, and don't stop yourself, you know, don't be the one to tell yourself, no, just figure it out. And, and you'll see how, you know, these opportunities will just, break wide open for you. So uh, be courageous, be curious, um, and just, you know, take those next steps. We only live once. Mm -hmm.